What a treat. We are so pleased to have with us Phil Collins. Do I need to say any more? He is a drummer, a singer, a performer, a composer, a philanthropist, a father, an activist, a painter. The list sort of I thought goes... I you were going to say philander. <laughs> yeah, well, we could get into that if you'd like to do that. He started way back when. Here, here was the child actor, the star, playing the artful dodger <laughs> yep. in, in Oliver. Did you think you had a future as, as an actor? Well, I was drumming from the age of five, yeah. so really I couldn't join a group then. <laughs> It was so a little I had, young. I had to do something <laughs> until I grew old, you know, yeah. was older. So my mother um, befriended someone that ran a dancing school who wanted to open a drama agency. Yeah. And eventually got a drama school and still runs and she's still doing it at 85. But uh, then she uh, was answering the phones and starting this agency up. And she got a call for kids, you know, Oliver was on, it was a big mm -hmm. hit musical. Can you send us down some, a few people that might be suitable as the Artful Dodger? She said, yes. You know. uh, so I went for the audition and got it, and um, really, I did. I did lots of stuff like that, yeah. but uh, really biding my time. But was that it. in your family? I mean, did this no. all come naturally? Or? Well, no. I mean, my my father was, uh, you know, in the city of London for forty years, you know, and uh, so. It, but he, he used to have a boat, and um, he. Uh, belonged to a club where other people had boats and all those people got together three or four times a year and did yeah. shows. Oh, okay. So from, from about the age of five or six I was playing the drums yeah. and I was also Humpty Dumpty you know, and this kind of thing, <laughs> which I know will come back to haunt me, but um, I did all that stuff, yeah. So obviously they put the pieces back together again. Mm. Now, the playing, the, uh, the composing, the drumming, you say the drumming is where you live. Yes. It is really. I mean, I, I, you know, as you get older, you, you try to stop fooling yourself and try to be as honest as possible yeah. about what you are, who you are. And um, I am a very good drummer, <laughs> but I'm a much better I, I, drummer. I'm not going to dispute that, OK? <laughs> uh, but I'm a much better drummer than anything else. You know, yeah. I can mark myself out of 10 with songwriting. I can mark myself out of 10 as a singer and anything else I've done, but as a drummer, I know my strengths. So what are you? Ten out of ten on drumming? Oh, I, no, no, I was, there's, there's, no, no. I'd say I was about eight out of ten, maybe. Um, but I, I don't know, five out of six out of ten or something for mm -hmm. singing. Five or six out of ten for songwriting. You know what I mean? Uh, but um, that's what I, that's what I do. And I, and I've now just rediscovered that with my big band. Yeah. And I had the most fun taking that thing out. You know, I was going to play in Canada, but that showed, you know, something happened in the festival. Didn't, didn't have us. But, um, you know, it's wonderful for me to, to be playing drums again. How do, well, you talk as if there's been kind of a catharsis of some kind or a decision. I mean, is it, is it middle age? Is it leaving Genesis? What is it? Well, leaving Genesis opened up a lot of space in my life, you know, yeah. which I needed. Um, I mean, I'd stayed with Genesis for about, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years with both careers going, you know. Yeah. And that was a leapfrogging process. I'd do my album, and then I'd do my tour, and then by that time, a year or two had gone, well, two years at least had gone by, and then Genesis wanted to do an album, Genesis wanted to do a tour. So there was nothing else, no other room for anything else creative in my life. So what with having done it for 25 years, I thought, this is now... When I did both sides, which was my most personal record and yeah. most complete record, because I did everything, um, that's when I decided to leave the band. I thought, now is the time. I found my feet. I want to do other things. And um, that opened up all this space, which I don't want to fill. Mm -hmm. You know, I want some space in my life now. But I do the big band and, and uh, music for movies and stuff like that, which is something I'd like to do, because I can do it from home. But I, maybe, maybe the failure, or relative failure, I mean, the, the records still sold more than a lot of other people's records, but compared to what was expected from me after, but seriously, both sides and Dancing to the Light were failures, you know. Or slow records. Yeah, I, that uh, might be closer. Yeah, and uh, so you start to sort of think, well, you know, philosophically, I'm quite prepared for that. You know, I've had a fantastic run in the 80s, you know, yeah. uh, the early mid 80s through to the nine, early 90s. It was, you know, well, actually, mid 90s really, um, the, including Genesis stuff. Uh, you know, nothing can last forever. So I kind of I got comfortable with that. And anything else now is a bonus. Yes, but you can't really imagine not performing, not creating, 
not making no, music? No, no, no. Well, no, because I mean, of what I'm doing, performing. Although it's not in the in the mainstream, the big band thing I did is yeah. is me performing where I prefer to perform the best, you know, which is at the drums. But um, uh, no, no. I mean, writing music for movies would be would be creating, and I'll still write songs. You know, the, 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 I, I'm not saying I'm I'm retiring or finished or slow. Yeah. I'm just I'm just sort of seeing things as they really are. I'm seeing things that, that my life will never be the same as it was in the 80s from a success point of view. So therefore, I've I've got I'm quite happy with that. I'm I'm, I'm adjusted to that. And At so that, peace. Yeah. So that's that's the. Um, is that about being in love too? Is that important to you? It helps. <laughs> Seriously. No, I've been in love before. I know you have. I was married twice. But, I know. Um, um, is that a uh, balance things, in your life? It's certain things happen at certain times in your life, and that's how I can only justify it because I can't find reasons. You know, I, I couldn't have done what I do, what I'm doing now, back then. It, right. it just, I, I did what I wanted to do then, and I'm now doing what I want to do now. But um, I live in a place which is, which is very peaceful. I mean, it's not boring, but it's peaceful. And I live a life, a uh, simple life, same as I've almost, same as I lived in England, really. But, um, you know, I, I'm learning how to relax and kind of enjoy myself a bit more. I mean, enjoy myself. That's, I, I've always enjoyed myself. <laughs> but I mean... Enjoy yourself in a different way. Yes. You know, read books and do nothing and... What do you read? I read a lot of autobiographies and biographies. I'm reading Noel Coward's biography. Yeah. Right? It's very interesting. <laughs> um, there's all kinds Are of... Are you going to write your own? Yeah, I think that's... I think that's the thing to do. I mean, autobiographies are really the only way you know yeah. anything close to the truth. And, um... I, there's someone wrote a book about me recently. Well, people have written books yes. about me. But, I mean, there was a Ray Coleman book, who's a very respected journalist. And a book writer. He wrote books on Eric Clapton, John Lennon, and McCartney. And, uh, but he died before the book finished. And so the book is kind of a half hearted attempt. Well, half hearted book. You know, I mean, yeah. his wife tried to finish it, bless her, oh. but, she, but she couldn't. So, um, and also, you know, it's people, it's a view as other people see it, as opposed to the truth. Yeah. And if, if we're capable of telling the truth about ourselves. So yeah. I try my best. That's the question. We'll continue our conversation with Phil Collins in just a moment. Let's take a little listen to this first, though. Bill Collins, Dancing to the Light, the, the Africa influence there, where'd that come mm. from? Well, I was listening um, to a lot of Yusu Ndur and uh, Salif Keita, um, and, you know, African rhythms have really always been in my dictionary, you know, I'm a drummer. Yes, you know, Back to exactly. that thing again, you know, that's... In, in the commercial break, I've got to say, <clears throat> Phil Collins sits there, do what you were doing. Well, I just... You just, all the time you do it, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, it's, it's my practice. It's... <laughs> You're practicing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but, I mean, to me, it's not. It shouldn't be. A, it was a surprise to some people. Why the African influence when I did the album? But to me, it, as a drummer, it's part of. The, it's a world world of music, a world music, and a world of music. Yeah. It's only recently where it's become sort of hip to sort of have yes. world music. But I mean, yeah. of course, you know, uh, I'm my first ever hero on the drums was or certainly influenced. I mean, Ringo was the first hero, I suppose. But it was this guy, Roger Powell, who, is, who won't believe I'm even talking about him. Because, you know, he's, he's actually was in my favorite band, which is now reformed, but um, called The Action. And uh, he was my biggest hero. And he, I did everything he did. And he... I mean, was this when you were a kid? I mean, when you were This was like mid-teenager. Okay. I was really sort of listening to this and that. And, uh, I, you know, I heard him play many, many times, he was one of my biggest heroes, and he went in, he, he was influenced by African drumming, so I went and did the same thing. Yeah. Ginger Baker, you know. It was kind of always there, but um, now you have artists like Yusu and Duran, Salif Keita, and many, many others that are just so wonderfully joyous music, and I wanted some of that. 
So I was listening to a lot of that on the tour, on the Both Sides tour, which, when I was supposed to be my most miserable. Yes. In fact, I was very happy. Because uh, once you'd written the album about your, you know, marriages breaking up and life <clears throat> being lousy, then you were kind of exercised of it? Well, you've been the very first stuff. Um, well, yes, uh, you know... We're gen we over uh, we get we've come into a period now where we're generalizing, not you, but I find myself generalizing that those are the divorce albums. You know? <laughs> well, in fact, they're not. They're just... They're just they haven't happened of, at that time. Some of those songs are about that, you know. Yeah. But really, it's, um, um, you know, I don't always write about myself, you know. Every, you know, In the Air Tonight is not necessarily about what was going on. You know, there's different songs are, and, mm -hmm. and most songs aren't, but they are about relationships. Um, is that the best fodder for material? And, I mean, it seems to be true of poetry, it seems to be sh true of lyrics, that it's about relationships, it's not about you as an individual. Well, it's about people, yes. I think it's, it's people, how we relate to each other as, as people on the street or in the privacy of your own home. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the games we play with each other. It's the, the male strutting, you know, and the female plumage. You know, I mean, it's all these animal behaviour. And I just think, you know, it's, it's stuff... You can see why we have a problem in, relationships. you know, relationships yeah. and also with countries at war, you know. Yeah. It's all the same reasons, really. It's just no what one wanting to see, see, you know, things from the other person's point of view. We were talking a moment ago about whether you can really be honest and truthful about yourself. Uh, I mean, what kind of a guy are you? Are you a caring and sensitive <clears throat> 90s guy? Are you pretty yeah. traditional? Which one, or both? Well, I don't know if they're not the same thing. Are they traditional? I mean, I think... Well, again, we come down to this sort of strutting thing where men shouldn't yeah. cry. Yeah. So know. when was the last time you cried? Oh, when someone got a gold medal at an Olympics. You know, really? I mean, I'm very emotionally involved. <laughs> no, I feel, I feel, I think this is what a fantastic moment for them. Oh, I'm so, you know, I don't <laughs> go soppy, but I mean, no, I, I, I'm very, you know, a sentimental person, romantic. Uh, and I, if, if, being, if that's what being a 90s guy is, I guess I'm a 90s guy. Okay, then what about this other side? You know, the, the guy who the, the guy who <laughs> divorces his <clears throat> wife by fax. That's not true. <laughs> no, that's not true. You're, okay. just, you're just you're just prodding I'm me. Just now. teasing you. Okay. <laughs> Tell the story then what really <clears throat> happened. Because everybody still believes that. I know they do. And no matter how many times which is which actually goes to show the power of the tabloids because you can spend ages denying something, but it's yeah. the thing that fir people first read yeah. that they believe. Um, Oh, no, I don't know if I want to go into the sordid story, but, I mean, there was a fax. Yeah. Which ended up on the front page of a tabloid in, in England. And the kind of the facts over the, the, facts over yes. the years have been uh, have blurred to the point where I am supposed to have faxed my wife for divorce. And, I, you know, I can't imagine anybody doing, doing that. I can't imagine anybody doing it. Certainly, I didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, but there was this sort of, you know, a little bit of information here, a little bit of information there, and yeah. there. It suddenly gets put in one pot. I oh, know, Reg, let's make the story this. You know, and that's the story. The British uh, tabloids <clears throat> are something else. Can I say? <laughs> yes, yes, they are. <laughs> Complete wankers, basically. Yeah. But, um... Uh, Have you ever done the lawsuit? I mean, we just saw the Tom Cruise story the other day. You know, he's finally yeah. taken them to the mat and said, take that back and pay. Well, the thing about doing that kind of thing, as as, uh, as various people have you know, found out, is that what was carried in one or two, three papers then becomes a national issue. Right. And those that missed it the first time around get to hear it all the, first, the second time around. Um, so I don't know. Well, just well, there, was, there was nothing libelous yeah. about it. It was just wrong. It was just wrong. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, how a five-page fax that I you know sent to my to my wife at my personal her yeah. personal fax. Right. Got on the front page of the papers. That's what I'm interested in. No such thing that's as much, privacy uh, anymore. That's much more, yeah. uh, you know, revealing than what I said in the facts to me about how about it the got other there. parties involved. Yeah, okay. not necessarily the other party yeah. in terms of relationship, yeah, yeah. but I mean yeah. the, the other people that must have been doing something to get it. All right, yeah. we're going to carry on our conversation with Phil Collins, but first let's take a listen to "Take Me Home." Do 
a groovy kind of love with <laughs> Bill Collins. You can't say that anymore, can you? You groovy. can't really. Was, was that a send-up? <laughs> was what a send-up? <laughs> a groovy kind of love. Well, no, it was a 60s film, you <laughs> yes, see. So you're going to be period. <laughs> period, baby. A period piece. <laughs> that's it. Now, that's from the, the Buster soundtrack. Yeah. You were the star. I was. And I didn't want to sing. I tell you, I didn't want to sing. I, I resisted and resisted and resisted and got trapped in the end because I didn't want people to... It's hard enough for, for a, a, a singer or whatever, a musician, when you people know you as one thing, to try to spend an hour and a half trying to convince them right. that you're something else. I, I'm going to be a movie star yeah. and a train robber. Right. <laughs> so, you know, fortunately, my lack of image, which has prevented me from appearing on, because I'm not hip enough, on the front cover of magazines, worked to my advantage <laughs> when it came to acting because I was much more forgettable as a, as a personality. Where I, <laughs> you are not hip enough, excuse me. No, I'm not hip. Are you kidding? <laughs> But anyway, so Jagger, Sting, and Bowie, you know, they have very okay. larger-than-life charisma. Okay. And, uh, and I, I don't, you know, in the same way. And so uh, people, I found it easier for people to forget that I was Phil Collins, the singer, when I was acting. So I didn't really want to sing and remind them. So I put them in touch with various people that might help with the music. And um, in fact, in the movie kind of love, when I did that, I actually just thought... It would be, I gave them, I said, we should have a romantic song in the background mm -hmm. when Buster and June are going through their romantic thing. Yeah. Something like, I'll make you a tape. So I made them a tape of Groovy Kind of Love, yeah. which was what you hear in the movie, which is my little demo. I did it in 15 minutes. And they there. used that? They used it in the movie. Wow. And they used it right there. I said, no, no, it's supposed to be in the background on the radio, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but they put it right up front. And then, of course, they... They had it out as a single because it was such a big moment in the movie, and then I was singing in the film, but it was, it was never really meant so to be that So are way. you giving up on acting? <clears throat> Have you put that aside? As much as producing other people and things like that. I mean, I can't do everything all the time. Yeah. I'm happy, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing it. I mean, I, yeah. I really did enjoy it. I mean, frauds particularly, more than Buster. Yeah. which is an Australian film I did, which uh, will be discovered one day, because it's a very... It's very <laughs> a, a cult hit. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly better than it certainly was received. Yeah. But um, uh, I like doing it, but I just, you know, nothing... You got other stuff. Nothing happened, yeah. you know? I, sort of, I, I told all these people I wanted to act and, and met lots of people, and they all promised lots of things, and I go back to where I live, and they forget about me. But you do do it in your videos to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, you create little mini-movies. Yes, as much as, as you're allowed to do, you know, in four minutes or whatever. Yeah. Now, I just, I, I want to talk about that in a sec, but I have to ask about your hand, because I nearly forgot. When you were on tour in 94... Yeah. <clears throat> well, I don't know what happened. That's what even is more annoying and frustrating. I guess what must have happened is I, somewhere on the line, I must have fractured, a hairline fracture somewhere in my, in my wrist. And throughout the tour, which was a 14-month tour, oh. I was banging it with Terry. I said, ow. And the more it hurt, the more I banged it to try and get past the threshold of pain. Of course, in doing it, I, I actually ended up breaking the bone. And uh, after about a year, in Australia I was, so it was definitely... In, we, we started the tour on April 1st, 94, and we, we were in Australia in March, April of 95. And I went to the doctor. I said, listen, this has been hurting me now for like nine months. Can you please tell me what's going on? And he said, well, he yeah, x-rayed it. He said, well, when did you break it? I said, I didn't break it. He said, it's broken, boy, you know? And, and you'd been drumming. Yeah. I'm every night, ow, ow. <laughs> every night, I, it really hurt. But um, I just thought it would go away, you know? My dad died of a heart attack because he thought it would go away and he never told anybody. Yeah. So now I tell people when something's wrong, but... Um, yeah, good idea. But, you know, this bone is, stood, is dead now, of course, because it was dead before What I, does that mean? Well, it's just sort of... You can't pin it because it doesn't show up on an X-ray. <laughs> it kind of... <laughs> there's a dead bone in there. And the doctor said to me in, in Switzerland, he said, I could take it out, but I can't guarantee how mobile you'll be. Yeah, yeah. So he said, I suggest you just wait until it becomes unbearable, then you have to do something. And since then, it hasn't really hurt me. So you point. continue to play and it's... Yeah, I did two, two, two and a half hours with the big band every night for six weeks, well, two months actually with the rehearsal, and it didn't hurt at all. So I'm very lucky. Do you think it's fixed or is this mind over matter? Well, it's definitely broken. It's definitely still in there. It just has learnt, back, learnt to lay back and you know, enjoy it because you know, there's nothing I can do about it. It's just in there. 
And, but uh, sometimes performers have an ability to do that when you know you have to do something. Oh yeah, I mean I've been, I've had mumps and, and gone on stage and sung because you have to. I mean you can feel terrible yeah, but you and you go to. on stage and suddenly something else takes over and you forget you have a cold or you mm -hmm. forget you've got this and that and you come off stage and then you start coughing and sneezing and you remember but it's, it's that adrenaline I suppose. You got those hands insured? Uh, I don't think so, no. <laughs> I don't know. He's a drummer and he hasn't <laughs> got them insured. We'll continue our conversation with Phil Collins. Let's take a little listen to Don't Lose My Number. <laughs> You can't hurry, love. You should hear the running commentary <laughs> from Phil Collins as we look as the, at these bits of tape. Come on, that's fun. Oh, yeah, that took six <laughs> hours to do that. <laughs> because? Uh, well, that's, that's quick. Jumping, Sorry. I know, I know it is. But I mean, no, yeah, it was just so, so easy to do, you know, and yes, it's one of the most memorable, sort of, you know, one of the simple things again, you see. Yeah, the, videos, simple. the simple videos are always the way. Like, did you things. listen to the Supremes? I mean, oh, why yeah. did you pick that? Well, there was, there was, when I was growing up, there was. Stacks and Atlantic, which was Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, yeah. Sam and Dave, Percy Sledge. There was Motown, yeah. which was fantastic. Four Tops, Temptation, Stevie Wonder, Martin yeah. Vandella, Supremes, and then there was the Beatles, you know. Yeah. And of course, all the other northern bands. <laughs> the but, northern uh, bands. Now, we had Sir George Martin on the program uh, last mm. season. I mean, the, the man behind the Beatles. And there, were, there was Phil Collins. He, he got all of these people, you and Goldie Hawn and Jim Carrey and everybody to do songs. You did, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, numbers, yeah. Well, he wrote to me and said, uh, you know, dear Phil, I'm trying to think about making my last record. Yeah. And I would like you to, to sing Golden Slumbers. And, uh, you know, it's like being summoned by the Queen or something. Yes. I mean, you can't just, how could I refuse? I mean, I love the man. I, I first met him in 82 um, with a Prince's Trust, first, mm -hmm. very first Prince's Trust mm -hmm. concert. He and Pete Townsend organized the band. Mm -hmm. I was a house drummer, and after that I got involved in every concert and became a trustee of the Trust. But um, Part of your philanthropy, which yeah. we're going to get into after. But, uh, but George has become a very, very good friend of mine. And, um, you know, I would do anything for a man. But... But when we did Golden Slumbers, I was doing Dancing to the Light, and he flew over with his son Giles, and, and we did the track. And uh, he said to me, you just, just sing it and play the drums. I'll get somebody else to do the backing vocals. Don't worry about it. So I said, no, George, I, uh, this is, this, I want to do this. You know, don't just try and cut, think I'm in, it's, it's an imposition. I, I want to do it. So I said, OK. So we got to, you never give me your money. And he said, dong. OK, this was George's part, you know, and he'd sing me, well, I knew the part, but he yeah. just gave me the note. He said, this is, what, this is the harmony that George sang. And then we went through all the parts, all the, you know. And you sang all the parts. Yeah. But it was, I was there doing it with the guy. Yeah. It was one moment I couldn't possibly have missed that moment. And that's, my life has been like that. So lucky. I've, I've worked with so many people that I grew up thinking, wow. I'm yeah. never even going to meet the man, and suddenly you're playing with him. Yeah, and he's come to you. Yeah. You know. I mean, that's, I mean, it's an amazing thing what you describe, because s people think the Beatles are the Beatles, and, and, and George Martin is some guy behind the scenes, but he was a creative force. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, there are many bootlegs out of, of um, Beatles stuff, work in progress, you know. Yeah. And, of course, they, they're a fantastic band. I mean, melody, voices, composition. But you hear the, 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 the rough tracks, yeah. and then you hear what happened on, in the end. And After Jeff, he got his hands on Jeff them. Emmerich, who was the engineer, and George Martin. They did, them, they did that stuff on half the equipment that I did my first record on, right. which, is, which prompted me to use my demos on all my records. Because I thought, yeah, it's good enough for them, you know what I mean? Right. And we've had this conversation, him and I, many times about 
what is wrong with today's music, amongst the many things that probably is wrong with today's music, including my, my music, is then you had four tracks and you had to, to, to progress to the next stage of a track. You had to commit yourself. Right. So a band came into the studio and the engineer and the producer and the band all reached that point where the song sounded great, the performance was great, everything was great. Now mix it, because before we put that tambourine on or that lead guitar solo, we have to mix this down. Right. So that spirit of that song was there. You could never change that because it was mixed down, it was too late. And you didn't take six guitar solos and choose them next week, you did it then. Yeah, that's a really interesting... And on one track you had a tambourine, yeah. a guy playing tambourine, yeah. a guy playing guitar. And that is why those records sound so great, because there was never the multiple choice of 75, right. 78 tracks, which George actually likes. Because I say, well, I wish it went back to the old days, you know, it'd be so much easier. And he said, and he said no, oh, no, 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 you don't know what it was like. Yeah. I'm, sure it was, I'm sure it was murder yeah. for, the, for the creative. But there thing. is that, I mean, that, you know, what do you love and what do you hate that you hear these days because of those kinds of things? Well, I, I mean, there, there, there's, I mean, some rap music, for example, you've got some fantastic production techniques. I mean, these, the way these records are produced are very, very hip. But I don't, I watch MTV and I don't understand it. And that's kind of, in a way, I just don't get it, you know, and I don't want to sound like my dad here. I, you know, I'm kind of a hip guy, I, I can, I don't listen to all kinds of stuff. I don't know what those kids are listening to these days, eh? And the hair, no. Um, no, I know that I'd sound like dad, my dad, I don't, but it's just, I, I don't, what it is, is I like some of it, there's good and bad. I, I yeah. love, there's some rap I really like, for example. Uh, rap, for example, you know, I, I like yeah. some of that, I hate some of it because it's very negative. There's all kinds of music that, that is good and bad, you know. It's not just um, rap, but it's just that I watch these, these uh, award shows and things like that, and I just think, this isn't the same, this isn't the same business that I'm in, surely. Yeah. I can't compete with this. This, this, I don't, this isn't, I don't understand this. So one of those philosophical things that I've come to terms with is the fact that I do what I do, yeah. in the same way that over there, Bob Dylan does what Bob Dylan does. Yeah. You don't compete with that anymore. You worry about who's number one. I'll just make my records. And, yeah. but, and maybe that's the way to deal with it, I mean, which is that we do have too much choice in some senses to decide, but, but there is room for the niche as opposed to oh, yeah. everybody loving yeah. Elvis or oh, everybody right. I mean, loving Frank Sinatra. We were talking to Stephen Fry I mentioned earlier and in his autobiography, you know, he, he says, thank God that my mum and dad didn't like my music. Yeah. And thank God I don't like the young people's music today. Yeah. Because that's what it's all about, you know, and that is what it's all about, you know, I mean, it's... It's like when I, I'm sure when I say to my son, hey, that song sounds great, so I, yeah. he says, uh-oh, uh-oh, better change it. You what know. do your kids think of you? Um, well, they know what I look like. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, good. <laughs> no, my, uh, oh, I don't know. I said, to, it's a funny thing, I, I was, I said to my youngest daughter, Lily, the other day, because this hits albums out, I said, you know, a lot of, what I do next, because she said, what are you doing? You know, are you going on tour again? I'd love to come on tour with you, Dad. So I said, How old is she now? She's nine. Yeah. So I said, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to tour again. A lot of what I do next depends on how people react to this, this, right. this hits record, for example, because, you know, it's one of those things where I don't want to go out there and just do it for me. I want people to still... You want to do it for me? I want it for... Well, yeah. you know, if people still want to hear it, I'll yeah. go out and do it, you know? Otherwise, I'll just make, write the songs and keep them to myself, you know? But... Um, she said, uh, so, and I said, so I was thinking, you know, maybe I, in one of my darker moments, I might have thought of retire. And she said, you're not going to retire. You can't retire, Dad. And she's only nine years old. Yeah. I don't even know she knows what retire means. You know? <laughs> But it was... Um, so she listens, so she, she knows. listens, yeah. She yeah. listens and she, um, she says, can you put you... I mean, I don't listen to my stuff, really, to be honest, but she said, can I put, put your tape on in the car? And she sings along with it and she, she loves it. Simon has been influenced by Genesis quite a lot. Yeah. You know, because that's when, what he was listening to when he was growing up. And now he's 22 and he's, right, he's got his own record deal and he's going to put his own record out next, next spring. Isn't that and my good? daughter's an actress, you know, Jolie, the oldest daughter, yeah. she's 26, she's an actress and she's doing fantastically well. She won a, a big award for Madison, for the soap. Oh, isn't that great? That she was in. So they've all, they're all, I mean, Lily, of course, is too young, but um, Simon and Jolie are, are all doing their thing and it's great. But do they keep you sort of in line? I mean, you know, to them you are just dad. Oh, yes. No, no, it's, it's, you know, sometimes, and Simon particularly, because um, we're both musicians, yeah. he will um, he will react very strongly to something, you know, and say, 
this is fantastic, Dad. Uh, hmm. And other stuff he'll, you know, he won't, he won't get. But you know, he'll, he'll be very specific about about praise and criticism. Yeah. You know, which is which is. And nice, is he that, right? Honestly. Like, do you, do you agree when he hones in on something? Well, he likes the things that I hope he likes. Yeah. You know, which is good. But I'm sure, he, you know, I'm sure he dislikes some things that I that I I, li I wish he'd like. Yeah. But then you know, you know, we, we are different. We are different. He's a musician. I'm a musician. But we're all you know, there's, there's 25 years difference. Yeah, but it kind of keeps you in touch, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It? Oh, it, it's definitely. I mean, I, I rub off on him, he rubs yeah. off on me. We continue uh, our conversation uh, with Phil Collins in just a moment. We're going to come back and, and look at some of these videos you produced, too, because I want to hear you on that. Uh, but right now, we'll listen to uh, Separate Lives. This is from the movie White Nights. I can't go out, just holding on. Remember those cold winters. You need to the job, put a respect, so you get out while you can. We always need to hear both sides of the story. Both sides of the story. Phil Collins, both sides of the story. More of the the social commentary. Yeah. Do you consider yourself an activist? No, I'm a fence sitter, really. I've got to be <laughs> honest. I mean, saying there's both sides of the story, I guess, is in, in a way being non-committal. But I just wish that we were all a bit more. Um, what is the word I'm looking for? A bit more uh, aware and, and patient with our fellow man. And and. I can't believe that we're still fighting religious wars. You know, yeah. we can get a man on the moon. We can get a man round the moon. We can get a man going round the moon. You know, up in space. And there's twice. Ireland in the Middle East, and there's yeah, you know, and, and, they're, and they're just fighting because they believe in a different god. You know, I just think it's um, it's unbelievable. And that, that's that's. And I actually, when I wrote that song, you know, um, the, the critics, you know, as usual, had a go at me. But I turned the television on one Sunday. And this was just after In a Skillin, I think. Hmm. And I turned the, the television on and it f faded in. And there was a father who'd lost a, uh, lost a, a relative. Uh, I think he lost a child, obviously. But uh, he, um, he said, I just wish that people would understand there's two sides to everything. We both have our beliefs and we don't believe the same thing. It's both sides of the story. And I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, thank you. <laughs> you know? yeah. I turned the television off and thought, yes, you know. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the way most people think, but um, I'd like to think it was the way most people think. But they're just, you know, this, we don't, we're not very considerate. We're not very, yeah. um, I wish I could think of the right word, but I, we, we're not what, very, you know. What motivates you? Because you've done a lot of philanthropic uh, things. I mean, there's Band-Aid and there's the Princess Trust. And, you know, there's, uh, in this country, you have been a big benefactor of the famous people players and dealing mm. with the mentally handicapped and those kinds of things. Where does that come from? Well, part of it is because you're asked. Yeah. I mean, Band-Aid, I was asked to. I, I, Rob, um, Bob Geldof, he called me one day when I was in the studio with doing No Jacket Required. He said, Phil, you don't know me. Did you see the television last night? And I said, no, I've been working. He said, well, I'm, do I'm making a record next week, next Sunday. Uh, me and Mitch have, uh, me and Mitch <laughs> have written a song, and you're the only famous drummer I know. So, <laughs> so can you be there? So I said, OK, yeah, there's me. He said, there was me and George Michael and Sting. Those are the people he mentioned. I got there, and there was like, everybody was there. He invited everybody, and the record turned out to be the record. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I didn't do it because I saw the, 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 the pictures, you know. I did it because I was asked, and then suddenly you think, wow, OK, yeah. Uh, then Live Aid happened and all that stuff with the two continents, so I did that because it was possible. Someone suggested, you know, my friends were playing in America, uh, Clapton and Robert Plant, you know. Right. And I did my stuff with Sting in, in England, but I wanted to play drums with someone, you know, because I'm kind of used to being the house drummer, you know, I'll play with anybody. <laughs> and the, so someone said... You well, can come on over to my house <laughs> and play the drums, okay, if you want, yeah, sorry, if carry you on. Get, if you get, if you really want to do it, you can get Concord and get over there. I said, yeah. okay. Yeah. And I wasn't the only person that was going to do it. Other musicians were going to do it, but they backed out. So I ended up being the only one. 
Mm. But uh, so that's the reason for that. But you know, with the Princess Trust, you get asked to do these things and the homeless shelters and stuff like this. I wrote that song, Another Day in Paradise. Did the video because that's the images that I've seen throughout my travels. And without thinking, of course, I can now work with the homeless. Right. I didn't really get that far that quick. But they saw the video and then sort of said, can we use this as part of our conference material? So is that kind of your role? I mean, that you don't have to be down at the soup kitchen every night uh, dishing up the soup. But what you have to do is motivate and you can use your fame and your power and your money to do that. Well, it depends. It's very, I mean, there's different ways you, you do it. You get involved. I mean, with the Prince's Trust, I do... When I was living in England, I went every year to this week of work, sport and leisure where they get 400, potentially a time bomb, 400 unemployed and potentially unemployable kids yeah, yeah. under the same roof for a week. And they try and motivate them and, and educate them about it, working with computers, trying to how to apply for a job. You know, the guys with Mohicans go and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a job, you know me. <laughs> they uh, know how to ask for Not it. Not likely. <laughs> so, um, and this is, the, they're, they're, they think they're on the scrap heap, you know, but yeah. they're not. And that's what the Princess Trust does. So I used to go down there and stay three or four nights and play a gig at the end of the week, teach them how to play instruments, be part of them, just be there to answer questions, ask questions. Or whatever. And um, so at that point, I had hands on, you know. Uh, with the shelters, we invited them to come to the concerts and collect money. Mm -hmm. And then we made a video on the both sides tour of the rehearsal for the tour and we sold that. And we not, we no, not one penny went anywhere else other than to the shelters yeah. in that particular town. And even the last tour of America, which we didn't have uh, shelters involved with, retrospectively at the end of the tour, I sent every, every town that we played in, I sent one of the shelters a, l a lump sum. Do so you, some of it, you just do it because it's, you can do it. I'm so does that make you feel better? Yes. It, pur it purges some of the guilt for earning so much money doing something I like. Yeah. That's the first thing. I, mean, I, I do, I've always felt a bit funny about you know, I, I work because I'm, this is fantastic. I mean, it is work, but I mean, yeah. sometimes it's less work than others. And there's this guy shoveling money in a bucket as I go, by, and that's the kind of, um, I've had trouble dealing with that. I've come to terms with the fact that I've got loads of money now. I accept it. Yeah. But I do, people write to me hundreds of letters a week, and I, in some stories that touch me, they get helped, you know. But um, it does make me feel better. Yeah. Which makes, which says something about me that's not particularly good, I don't suppose. No, not necessarily. But, um, yeah. I want an excuse to listen to I Wish It Would Rain Down, just because I want to hear it. Can we just listen to it? Sure. <laughs> All right, let's just listen to this. <laughs> Appendicitis. What are you doing to me? He'll miss the opening. This is the most important number in the show. can someone else sing it? What about Billy? He's got a good voice. Who is this? He used to be the drummer in a really good band, and when the singer left, he took over. Let me ask you a question. How good can he be if he's back playing drums again? We didn't actually get to the music part, but what a gang. It's, I mean, my, favorite, but it's my favorite part, <laughs> the hell with the music. Eric Clapton and... Uh, Lamont Dozier. And Jeffrey Tambor, who, from Larry Sanders, yeah. that everybody yeah. knows. Oh, fantastic. Well, there was a, there was a period where... We got, me, me and Jimmy U. Kitchen, Paul, Paul Flattery, the director and the producer, we had such great fun doing these videos. Um, that we were able to get all these people... <laughs> to come and play. Yeah, to come and play and sort <laughs> and of... And I don't mean music, yeah, instruments. a like. script, you know, we had yeah. a script. It was like a little mini movie. Yeah. I mean, that thing, literally, it goes through a bit of Gone with the Wind. It goes through yeah. everything. I mean, it's, it's a real epic. It took three days to make that one, but it's... Um, <laughs> three that, whole days. Yeah. <laughs> They're good fun to look back on something. Yeah, it is fun to do that. You were talking a few moments ago, and we had the conversation in the break, too, about kids, because we'd, yeah. we'd had that conversation, that, that part of why you're looking for some time now and not to fill everything yeah. up is because you've got to kind of make up. You've got to fill in those blanks. Yeah, you know, this kids grow up thinking all kinds of things. I mean, I had this conversation with Lily, actually, when she came over in the summer, yeah. about when your shutter goes off. You know, when your, when your camera works, how, why you'll remember a particular event in right. your childhood right. that your mother and father may not remember. Right. Your camera goes off, theirs doesn't. Yeah. And um, we, had these, we were sitting in the pool you know, with, the, with, the, with the ring sort of splashing around and, she's, and she loved these chats. Every day she'd say, can we go to the pool and have a chat? <laughs> so I go, and we'd talk about this moment and then something happened and she really loved it. I don't know what it was, but she said, Dad, 
I think my camera just went off. <laughs> it was like... Oh, that's a great phrase. Yeah. yeah. But it's just, it is that moment that you remember. And, and all the stuff that you don't remember. And I'm finding now that I'm trying to bring my children up to date with how I feel about them. And how you felt when you weren't there. Yeah. You know, and it's very important because they, people go through life with an awful lot of baggage. Yeah. Some of it's unnecessary. You know, and... Uh, I mean, I, it's a very personal thing, and so I won't go into to very, really detail about it, but there was a song called Father to Son on, yeah. on But Seriously, which we did a clip for, because that, that we put out a video for the whole album, and we made a clip for that song. And this song is a pocket guide to life for my yeah. son. I wasn't there, so this is, read this, yeah. you know. If your heart's beating too fast, she's probably the girl for you, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And... Um, and he didn't see it, of course. He had no access to it. No one told him it was out. I didn't think to send it to him because it was yeah. a compilation. I just thought, you know, he wouldn't. If he wants to hear it, he'll, he'll find it, you know. I mean, he heard the song, obviously, but not the video. And he came over and he saw the video and really touched him. Really, yeah. really touched him. And I thought, wow, where, where do I start now? Because if, if, that, if, that is, if that's touching, then you there's got always so much other more stuff I've got to say. Yeah, it's... That's great. Well, you're touching him through the music just like you continue to, uh, to touch all of us. Thank you so no, much. Pleasure to be a here. real pleasure to meet you. you. The new album hits, and we'll take a listen to True Colors, the Phil Collins version, as we say goodbye.